So today's true crime is about a young young lad who lived not far from here and went to school not far from here. He went to school in Kingston and his name is Roy Leslie Tuttle. So Roy was 14 years old. Before I start this, I just wanted to just say all these videos is put together by myself and all information which is online and obviously some videos which are out there in the media in the domain so I'll just kind of correlate them all together to do a video for Roy in his memory but I just wanted to make this kind of clear and to just say that I just wanted to put out there that every victim who has suffered from a at the hands of brutal murderers um, should be respected so anybody who is seeing this video and commenting please have some respect for those young kids or young people or people who have been murdered by these brutal evil villains that are out there and the important thing is is obviously to stay safe and this is why I'm doing these videos is to bring awareness to be aware of if you see something a bit dodgy, a bit cagey, or you see a kid fitting or feeling quite right or a bit worried or maybe crying and a bit just, you know, it's better safe than sorry. Just intervene if you can, safely, obviously. Uh, same with women as well. If you see anybody who may be in distress and may need that, just a look and just to see if they're okay please just go up to them and just see if they're all right because you may be saving a life. So let me jump into this and let's be speak about Roy Leslie Tuttle. So on the 28th, 23rd of April in 1968, Roy was coming home from school. He went to Kingston Grammar School, seen uh, Kingston, sorry. So what was different about Roy? Roy wanted to save to buy a bike. Now he lived 15 miles away in a small town called Brookham, which is obviously 15 miles away. But unfortunately, the bus doesn't go straight there, so he had to get back two or three buses just to get home to see, to get to his family. So on his way home, he went with his friends. He got on the bus, boarded, boarded the bus with his friends, but only went halfway. And as he went halfway, he got off because again, he didn't want to pay the full fare, wanted to make sure he could buy his own bike, probably so he could ride to school. That's what he did in 1968. So. He got off at a stop and made his way. And what he used to do, he used to hitchhike home. Um, if I can remember, I think it's the A3. He used to hitchhike home to Brookham. Unfortunately, this time, he didn't make it home. And he is so reliable, all of his friends, Peter, a good friend of his who was questioned in regard to his disappearance, said that he was just a lovely guy and a lovely boy. He wasn't one to just disappear or run away. So obviously the police had to just identify whether that's what he may have done. Maybe he had a secret life, maybe he had a friend elsewhere, maybe he just wanted to just go and not be here anymore. But it didn't make quite much sense. Why would he just disappear if he's saving for a bike? Everybody knew he was saving for his own bike. And I remember me growing up and um, me being about 14, 15 and wanting to, my, me and my bike, we went everywhere together. I used to just, whenever things got stressful, I would just jump on my bike and I would just disappear. And it's the same thing. And but I was obviously, when you disappear, you've got to be safe. So I will just go and get my head clear. And so I assume that's probably what Roy was looking to do in order to just have some space and have his own independence. Um, again, he's 14, so hey, well, remember what you were doing when you were 14. You wanted to find your independence. And remember, this is 1968. There's many varied things that people have said about Roy and when he was last seen. So one person said that, a bus driver said, and the, the clearest description was from a bus driver when questioned by the police, said that he saw Roy hitchhiking and he was standing on lay-by talking to a man in which looked like to be in a unusual looking car. I'll insert a picture of the car here. So this is key, remember that car and it makes sense at the end of this video. So as I said, the bus driver was driving and obviously it's right hand side drive in the UK. So the car is going to be on the left and as you're driving a bus, you're going to be high up. So you probably couldn't get a really good description of the driver, but he just said that he remembers seeing 
this boy and I, and insert what he was wearing on that day because the uniform is distinct. You cannot mistake this individual, this boy, um, Roy, with the uniform that he would wear. It, it's a grammar school. It's not like an ordinary school. It's a grammar school. So over in the UK, we have state schools and we have grammar schools. Grammar school is a bit more financially. You have to probably pay to get into grammar school unless you get a scholarship. And within that, you have a blazer. And as I said, as you saw that, vid that picture, you have to be dressed a certain way. You have a certain uniform. And the only time you wear a uniform in normal state schools is if you go into a, like a Roman Catholic school. So let me move on and let me just explain a bit more. So uh, remember I mentioned Peter. Peter was Roy's friend and he was one of the last people to see him as he got off the bus. So he said he, he, would, he would naturally do this. He would just naturally go off the bus and hitchhike his way home to Brookham from Chesson. And the last place he was seen was in Chesson, which is not too far away from um, where, from Kingston, probably about five to 10 miles. So he was almost home. He was almost close to home. And again, these places are really, really leafy, really um, kind of like well-respected. It's not like you get burnt out cars and it's like dodgy individuals, but it was just, it's really, it was really ab abnormal for someone to go missing especially in 1968, especially in Surrey, like Surrey, which everybody knows each other. So let me just explain. In the UK, you've got different pockets. So you've got like different villages. So villages be separated by fields. And in the villages, everybody would know each other. And if you, you're moving around, everyone's gonna know someone in one town. And if you're going to another state school out of the village, people are gonna know you by your blazer because everyone's gonna recognize that blazer or that uniform that scene. So Roy would have stood out like a sort of thumb. So, but he just disappeared off the planet and no one seen him since that bus driver. So again, he never arrived home. So his parents, Dennis and Hillary, um, um, reported him missing straight away that night. They couldn't find him, he never turned up. And as in the UK, obviously in anywhere really, as school gets quieter uh, or it gets, it gets darker, um, he would normally be home and safe, but he just didn't show. So obviously they got a bit scared and a bit worried because it's unnatural for Roy to just disappear without seeing something. Remember in them days in 1968, you never have mobile phones and you only have phone boxes which were just dotted around various places. You won't necessarily have them in the middle of a village somewhere or in the middle of a um, countryside. These phone boxes will be in the village or if you get one along the way between two villages, it'll be probably miles and miles out, out of town. So the stupid thing about the, the report that the police didn't do, so they reported um, Roy missing that night it wasn't until the following morning that they decided to file a report, a missing report for him. Now we all know that it's crucial when any child goes missing, when anybody goes missing, hours are of the essence, you have to act on it straight away. This is why parents or families or friends know, look, if they're not here by a certain time, that's unnatural. So if the person is normally back by eight and it's like half 12, and no one's called and you're ringing them and you can't get hold of them, then you're gonna start worrying. But you don't wait a whole night, especially a 14 year old. So 14 year old is gonna be missing for one night and then you decide to file a missing report. It was free, so moving on from there, um, they've done a search looking for um, Roy. Unfortunately, they found a body three days later. Three days later, they found a young boy dumped outside um, this gate, gated, um, kind of like it's like an estate, and I put the pictures up here. This body was found outside Charkley Court, if I get it wrong, I'll put the name up there, in Mickleham, Surrey. And again, the body which was taken to have autopsy done was reported to be strangled and assaulted. So let me speak about the investigation after that. Unfortunately, it was young Roy. He was strangled and suffocated and he passed away, sadly passed away.
what did the police do? What couldn't the police do in 1968? What resources could they have? Now, the police acted straight away. They only had the description of what the bus driver said. Now, it was a Westminster Mark II. I put the picture up here again. The driver said, the driver who was, the driver of the bus said that they saw the man, but could only get a glimpse of him at, at the angle he was driving. And they said he was short and stocky with whitey brown, whitey white-ish hair. Um, but he said that's all he can see. Um, but the crazy thing about it was that nobody else seems to have seen the scene Roy hitchhiking because I think he was known to do that. But this individual saw him, and obviously, this is what the driver saw. He was the only one to see Roy alive before, obviously, he was brutally murdered. They've taken uh, the item, the body and the clothing and try to run for forensics to see what was on it. Alas, nothing came up. Remember, it was 1968. We didn't have much good forensics back then. I think they were only doing like hand um, thumbprints and things like that. So they never had the, the capabilities which we have today in order to uh, really identify a culprit or a murderer or a killer in order to build up some kind of portfolio. So, what they had to do, and again, it was a small town, so what they did, they called on Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard was called in to assist in an investigation and a case, and they reviewed all the information that they had, um, and again, it came up with nothing. And he, again, checked and spoke to various people who may have seen Roy and may have known Roy, but they just couldn't come up with anything that could identify what happened to him or who could have killed poor young Roy period of time this case was reopened over the 30 odd years that the girls who tried to find the killer they you know they were reopening the case but again nothing really came of it it was just a cold case there was no leads uh, advancement in science wasn't done yet we couldn't identify fibers we can identify dna yet so we were pretty much we were pretty much just kind of lost with the information and all they had was a sus a suspect or a a view of what a suspect looked like but there was no concrete and the car which they were looking for which they'd done a search for but unfortunately they think they looked for about over twenty thousand vehicles of this westminster mark ii but again there was nothing to so it could link it to Roy or Roy being in that vehicle. So they did reopen it again, but they analyzed his, um, Roy's clothing again. And what they managed to find was a speck of blood. And on that speck of blood was believed to be the killer's blood. Um, or, and it was either a blood group A or blood group O. That's all they had to go with at the moment. So that is key to kind of like pulling this all together. This is a weird twist. The, the detectives in Scotland Yard travelled up to Scotland because there was a, a, a guy who was stopped and was convicted and pulled over because he was um, charged with the abduction of a 14-year-old boy in Aberdeen and the individual's name was Brian Field. He was in Solihull. So the other, he was sentenced for two years for this crime but it was very similar to how Roy was murdered as well that it was almost identical so obviously the people from scotland are flew down to or flew up should say to scotland to interview um brian field to find out if he had any links to um roy or if he was even in the area so he denied all knowledge of knowing roy which he would do wouldn't he really but they questioned him anyway but they had nothing else to go in so let's forward to 1996 and in 1996 with further development and technology came along dna was was kicking butt it was been it was cracking down a lot of people a lot of um, these murderers so what they did they found blood as i mentioned earlier on the trousers of Roy. And then look, and because they kept the trousers in a freezer, they can manage to pull off the fibers and then put it under a microscope to analyze what blood group and how they can link the DNA. It was just a matter of trying to link it to the, a perpetrator that has caused a crime and, and basically just linking it together. 
So now, as I mentioned, we're still in the 1990s and DNA has moved forward so much to what Scotland Yard has done now. They've, they've set up a new national review of investigations into unsolved murders. Now, this is focused upon unsolved murders, by, especially for children who have been murdered and the culprits have never been found. So this is really getting even more, more, everything pulling together now, everything it seems to be closing in on, on all these victims, helping these victims to find justice and all these murderers who have caused all these crimes have now been, been hunted now. They've got an, an amazing DNA, they've got this amazing DNA way of fighting crime, you know, and you can get it through saliva, you can get it through blood, you, it, it can be even traced through family members who have taken a swab test and they can trace it back to you and that's how many cases were, were solved. So moving on, there, were in, there was an investigation into two boys who were assaulted in Scotland and again who was in the area? Field. Again there was no links to him to, with these two boys but let's forward now to 2000s things are vastly moved forward now with this DNA situation, with DNA testing. And in 2011, there was hit DNA sample of um, Roy. The case was reopened and they managed to really find out that, so now it's 2011 and the blood that was found on Roy matched um, Brian's um, DNA. And I'm wondering how they've got Brian's DNA. Well, the guy was pulled over for speeding, so obviously they took a swab and then put it into the national database. Remember I told you in 1990s they did a national database so of, for DNA. So because they put the national database, anybody who's pulled over and any kind of DNA was take, taken, it goes straight onto this database. He went AWOL. However, he reappeared he, he disappeared off the radar, but he reappeared. He was working as a gardener for cash in hand. Now, isn't that a bit suspect? He's done a couple of offences, he's gone to prison. The police come and question him about Roy. Then he goes, disappears from um, Scotland, then disappears from Birmingham when they were questioning him. Then he just goes off radar and then doing cash in hand jobs. And in the meantime, remember, um, I, I didn't mention, Brian Field, I will explain later a bit more about him, that he had a family as well. So in the meantime, he had, he turned around and just went undercover to avoid the detection. They managed to find him and what they did, they didn't approach him straight away, they just set up a surveillance just to see what he's up to, what he's doing and then just to, he was now living in Birmingham so they're just keeping an eye on him just to see what he was up to and obviously that's where they identified that he was working as a gardener um, doing cash in hand. So they're watching him to see what he was up to, where he was going and if he was going to be um, offend again and if there was they can catch him in the act but that's not what they were waiting, they were just waiting to see just to make sure that this was the guy they were looking for. Because remember, it's almost 30 years now and he's aged somewhat and he doesn't have his ID and he's gone undercover. So they want to make sure that this guy is the guy before they pounce on him and they arrest him to make sure they got a 110% um, conviction to put this monster away. So let me read off what Brian Field's kind of history of offences were. In the 1970s, he had an assault in Aberdeen, two sentences in 1980 for four years counts of unlawful with underage boys and false imprisonment of two boys. So basically he imprisoned and assaulted two boys. He went to jail for four years. So on the 21st of February 2001, police arrested Field at his flat in Birmingham. He was in custody for 24 hours and they managed to get it extended a bit longer and he just had this big guilt trip. He decided to confess about killing Roy and what he did to him. Um, on, this is after the third night he confessed to everything and what he did do. Um, he admitted that he um, was the one who was spotted by the bus, by the bus driver. He um, he, com he admitted that he killed Roy, but he, he denied sexual, um, sexual abusing, sexual abusing Roy, which we clearly know that he did do. But ironically, when he 
when Roy was killed and murdered, brutally murdered, he was living in the area. Now, everyone thought he was just visiting, but he was living in the area. And conveniently, he, he left just after they started reviewing people. Now, that is just a, a total giveaway. Now, people wouldn't have remembered him or because he didn't stay in the area long enough. He was almost there a couple of years, then he moved away. So the police wouldn't even look on his, look, they wouldn't even, he, they wouldn't know if, he wouldn't have been on the police's radar. So that's why he just took his family and went away. What he said he did, he, um, he turned around and confessed that he pulled up and he saw Roy there getting a lift. He wanted to give him a lift, obviously, because Roy was hitchhiking. He decided to pick up Roy, drive for a bit, go into a lay-by where he assaulted him and strangled him with his own um, tie. But to make matters even worse than how sick this guy was, instead of obviously um, confessing, he decided to put Roy into the boot of his car, drive home, into a residential place, by the way, and at that time, Brian Field had a, a two-year-old baby, and he was married, so he drove home and kept Roy in the boot of his car, covered over in the boot of his car, for three days, and then he told his wife, look, I need to, need to go out, I need to deal with something, so he went out and drove down, he, was, he said he was looking around for somewhere to, to dump the body, he found these gates and it looked like he could be seen laser, he just basically took him out and threw him on the side. And then what he did do, he just covered him, covered right with his blazer. Now, as you, said, as a, you can see from before, that his blazer would stand out amongst some fields, you know, in, in, in some greenery, the, the colours he's got will stand out. But um, I just think that's just, just this sick. And as I said, he had a family and he kept Roy's body in a boot of his car for three days. And he admitted to this and obviously he was reluctant and he kept on saying that he didn't sexually assault him, which we clearly know that he did. You don't just strangle somebody and someone like him who is known for being a sexual predator and he, you mean to tell me that opportunity, he wouldn't have done it. So he, he was also dealt with. So let's speak about sentencing. So on sentencing took place on the 17th of November 2001, 65-year-old Brian Field was sentenced to life imprisonment for killing Roy Tuthill. Field admitted to the murder, but as I said, not the sexual assault. Unfortunately, um, which is so sad about this whole case, Roy's parents passed away before they even know they found Brian, so they didn't even know that his body, he's, they, found, they didn't even know that they found Roy's killer. So unfortunately he passed away. I believe Roy had a, a yeah, an older brother, so the brother knew and was campaigning, but Field was convicted of Roy's murder. Now, I would say not just him being caught, this was the only unsolved child murder in Surrey and now it's been dealt with and he's been convicted and he's spending his life in prison. As I mentioned, he had a brother and now Roy was the youngest so the older brother was Colin. Colin, when Colin found out, obviously his remarks was um, it's sad to see um, that my mum and dad didn't know that you know they found the killer but he's glad he's put him to justice. Um, and just some information I just want to put and say that what Roy used to hitchhike on A24 and obviously that's where he was um, he was abducted from and it's really sad because Peter as, yeah, as I said it was Roy's one of Roy's closest friends said that you know Roy wasn't the type of person just to go with anybody obviously he would have felt he trusted him and again remember um, Brian probably looked like a father so he probably was dressing as a dad so it, it, he would have probably felt safe thinking it'd be safe because obviously he would hitchhike and he probably wouldn't even thought that this would ever happen to him but you know my heart goes out to him and uh this obviously this crime was dealt with and, and he was put away and um spending his, his life in prison as, and so rightly so i just want to say a couple of things which 
um, Brian did before he got caught um, for killing um, young Paul Roy. So in 1983, at 17, he was um, arrested and spent two years in prison for messing with a 17 year old boy. And in 1986, um, he spent four years for um, abduction and other offences like sexual offences against a 13 year old and a 16 year old and ordered and what he did he kidnapped these two boys and ordered them to strip and threatened to kill him with a wheel brace but thank god the car jolted and the boys managed to jump out and get away and then identified him so he got arrested you would think he'd go down for that but hey he didn't he went to prison for four years for it but he was out again to probably commit more crime so the whole thing um, after the year which Roy was murdered, it took 33 years to bring him, Brian, to justice. But remember I mentioned uh, Westminster um, car, uh, Mark II car, which the bus driver said they, he said he saw this person driving. In fact, Roy was driving a Mini. This is why they were so focused on getting this Westminster vehicle that Roy was actually driving a Mini. So that led to nowhere. That's why it led to nowhere because it, the, the identification of the car was incorrect. So they would never have caught him anyway because they were looking for the wrong vehicle. However, in them days, cars were very similar anyway, especially minis and this vehicle looked very similar. So again, the driver of the bus was at a weird angle. So I don't really blame him for that. So if for the fact is that they gave a good description of who this guy was and it was identical to how he was back then. So I just wanted to say, you know, that these crimes are horrendous and I just think it's just utter sick how people can do stuff that's to children. 14, 15, two, three, whatever age. We need to obviously look out for each other and look out for young children and make sure that they're safe and women as well. And men, us all, we need to make sure that we stay safe. So again, as I said earlier, if you see, feel, or you think someone's in trouble, please don't just turn a blind eye and think, oh, it'll be okay. You don't know. You may be the one that is going to save their life. So on that note, I want to leave my love with you, and I hope you stay safe and look after yourself. And I'll see you in my ne next video. I'm Matt Vidal.